This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Presonus, API Audio, Isotope, Sound Porter Mastering, Jay-Z Microphones, and Spectra 1964. And you're hearing my voice right now on the Jay-Z BB29 microphone through the Spectra 1964 STX100 Mic Pre, C610 Comp Limiter, and Isotope RX and Ozone. So get ready to rock. Little things like that add up. Going back to the Bill Schnee thing, I learned all of that from him. I remember when I was watching him mix bass guitars. Half the time, I never saw him EQ anything on a bass guitar. It was more balance. That stuck with me because before then, I was EQing the absolute crap out of the bottom end of a bass to get it to fit in a song. Instead of hearing your environment and knowing that a bass is, if it's recorded properly, it's fine. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. I've got two words for you that will help you make your best record ever and not lose it. Storage and backup. You want fast drives for composing and recording and reliable drives for backup so you don't lose all your hard work when something goes wrong. That's why I chose OWC Mercury Extreme Pro 6G internal SSDs for my studio computer and Mercury Elite Pro external drives for archiving. Discover the best OWC drive options for your studio at maxsales.com slash rock stars. The Spectra 1964 STX100 Mic Pre provides unequaled headroom and linear output regardless of transient audio peaks, capturing critical details from your microphone. The 100 series amplifiers were used by Tom Dowd, Muscle Shoals, and The Record Plant on records by ZZ Top, Aerosmith, and John Lennon. Now you can get that same incredible sound in your studio at spectra1964.com or call them at 801-797-0642. Studio One from PreSonus is the ideal DAW for your home studio, taking you from songwriting all the way through mixing and mastering with a full suite of virtual instruments, guitar amps, and plugins for creative inspiration. It's easy to use for the beginner, yet fully customizable for your high-speed workflow as you become an expert. Get started now with Studio One Artist and PreSonus Sphere for access to all software, learning, and creative collaboration at PreSonus, wherever sound takes you. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Mark Daniel Nelson, a Latin Grammy-nominated producer and mixer. He's been producing, mixing, and managing creatives for over 19 years. Mark has previously been a guest on the show, and since our last interview, Mark's been diving headfirst into the film and TV world for music. In 2018, Mark engineered and mixed the score for the film Amanda that went on to be nominated for the French Academy Award for Best Score. That following spring, he mixed the score and music for the Ukraine film Ya Tai Vin, which was the last film Zelensky Vladimir starred in before becoming president. Ya Tai Vin went on to having the largest film opening in Ukraine history. In 2019 and 2020, Mark engineered and mixed the scores for a, a few Netflix Originals movies. And outside of film score work, he's been keeping busy mixing numerous large action trailers and continuing work in the album world with mixes for Francesca Battistelli, Eric Burden, Ben Harper, and many more. So please welcome Mark Daniel Nelson back to Recording Studio Rockstars. Mark, are you ready to rock again, my friend? Again. Again, I'm, indeed. I am ready again. All right. So in full transparency, uh, Rockstars, so you know what goes on behind the curtain. Mark and I have done all kinds of Herculean efforts to get here. In fact, we've already attempted this during um, crazy quarantines in the past and, uh, had, and had to reschedule, and here we are now. So we're excited to be here doing this. Tell us where you are, Mark. Last time I spoke to you, I think you were sort of in this beautiful vista overlooking the ocean, but we didn't have the right internet, and maybe now you're back in your studio. Is that right? Yeah, I'm, I'm currently back in L.A. in my room. Picking my nose, like, like I said <laughs> earlier. 
Um, I was up in Washington for the beginning half of the quarantine pandemic, and my parents live up there and on a cliff, and it's like neon green marshland, just really yeah. nice place to be when the world caught on fire. So I yeah. went up there. The only issue was there was no internet. The internet was so bad that I couldn't even upload a photo on text. So I had to like <laughs> drive into a small little fisherman town and steal internet from the public library that only had like 0.5 upload. And even that That's was great. from the best I could get. So that's great. I, I yeah, like, the last I like all the settings. You know, that, that sounds like the settings for one of those Netflix originals that you've probably been scoring. Uh, it was it was spooky. That's in, for sure. The in, whole in world fact, doing what it did. Yeah, sorry. In fact, um, I will share with you that, um, you know, during this quarantine time, I've watched, you know, a fair amount of movies and TV with my daughter and stuff. And, and um, I tried to get her to watch some show with me. And she's finally like, she's like, Dad, I can't watch this anymore. Like, everything you want to watch is some creepy show that takes place in a small remote fishing village. And there I was like, is. all right, all right. There we'll, it is. We'll watch Disney. Um, well, Groovy, well, welcome back to your studio. Uh, tell us a little bit about what your studio is and where you are right now. Uh, right now, I am uh, basically, I'm in Hollywood and I have a mixing room here that is functioning in a wonderful way now after I finally took a dive and bought a new computer, a Mac Pro 16 core that lets you do anything you wanted. And it was funny, I didn't realize how much of a difference it would have made off my other 12 core, but it really did. And is that one of the, me, the latest, those crazy looking cheese yeah, grater the, things? The cheese grater looking guy and I just wanted a computer I wouldn't have to worry about with certain, like Acoustica, that brand. It's unbelievable plugins, but you can't run it. It's not possible. And this computer lets me run at least 40 or 50 of them, which is wow. really cool. But it's it's a nice set up here. I have my ATCs and all my gear and my summing and my D command and toys and my dog comes in and sits with me and then I go upstairs and watch a show if I don't want to work anymore. Or I can go up on the roof and try to get some sun. It's been really hot, though. Yeah, I bet it's, it's, it's a heat wave here in Nashville right now. And of course, by the time everybody hears this, it'll be cooled off again. And, and exactly. hopefully your prediction, what you, you said something very telling. So you said halfway through quarantine, and you're the first person I've spoken to that is that has like, you know, slipped in a reference to exactly where we are in this thing. So hopefully we're, um, hopefully that's telling. Hopefully it's going to all be over another half from now or when I you're feel like, it, you know, I, I feel like it is. I feel like if, if the country can get focused together and be united and work through this together, I think we're going to look at some positive outcomes in the top of the new year just from hearing certain people i know that work in um, the bio field and stuff that have some intake on the vaccine solutions and stuff it's it's looking promising but I, everyone has to do this it's all hands on deck and sure sure we just kind of have to sit and i mean i'm absolutely exhausted from just sitting and <laughs> being bored tiring business right and then on top of it like growing a new field of anxiety and having this every day i feel like oh, I'm, i thought you were gonna say goatee <laughs> i started doing a beard right when it started and then i'm like no i'm not doing that <laughs> and then i just i just grew up my hair so my hair it's like there you go freaking. everybody's shagging out. everybody looks like they're in a 70s band now. that's why i was yeah i was talking to somebody about that earlier except like, for me i don't want to look like i'm in a 70s band anymore it doesn't look good just the beard. Yeah, I can't. I just, uh, well, you know, I had the long hair and the super long beard and I, I went short. So now I've got a, I'm just one buzz cutter away from having a haircut. The number two? The number Clip. two and the number three. The number three on the hair, the number two on the beard. Perfect. Yeah. Oh, wait, did you cut your beard down? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, I'm all wow. trimmed up and neatened up now, and I might even go uh, full shave here in a little bit. But Give it a go. at the risk of digressing too far, nobody tuned in for us to talk too much about the quarantine other than probably to ask you this question. What, talk a little bit about um, interfacing with this new, you know, staying at homeness as far as yeah. mixing goes. You know, like how has that sort of tied into your mixing routine? Well, right when this kicked in, I was kind of developing a new chain, mixing chain, and trying to figure out what do I need and what do I not need in order to be able to achieve what I need. And it was weird because I was cutting down a lot of gear. I still have it. It's all set up now. But at the time, um, I was living in Laurel Canyon in February. And I was downsizing everything into a small, like, rolling rack. And I had summing in it and really good benchmark headphone monitor and my tube tech multiband and API EQ. And my chain was set up with my template. And it was really good. And I'm like, this is great. And then COVID kicked in. And I'm like, well, no one knew what was happening, to be honest. Yeah. And not to go too much into it. But it was really spooky because... I was talking to a lot of people in LA and everyone kept saying, yes, I've heard that too, which was, it wasn't martial law, but how much are they going to actually shut down the city? And no one knew what was happening. And so I had to make a decision and go, okay, I'm going to go to Washington. So I drove 20 hours and I was able to take my mixing rig at that time. It was in this little rolling rack. Well, that's cool. And so you, you were able to, you know, portableize. Is that a I word? had to, cause I had two or three albums that I was currently in the middle of luckily there were just recalls on two of them and i had to figure it out i got up there and instantly had to start like looking for proper headphones to mix off of and i bought a lot i just kept luckily when there's nothing to do you can just wait for another pair of headphones to come and i came across the uh, a daisy headphones that i st oh, yeah. stuck at the, the lcd x's mm -hmm which were good. They weren't amazing, but they translated every time, which was really interesting because I got the ATC speakers because I liked listening to them and they translated. Mm -hmm. And then these headphones seemed to just translate, but I didn't like how they sounded. And I started getting a couple other projects and I mixed cold and through my analog chain and it worked very well. And then I mixed a Netflix movie score that was scored and tracked here. And I mixed that on headphones, which was really interesting. Mm -hmm. And that kind of opened my whole world. And that was right before you and I talked last time. And mm -hmm. I was like, this is interesting where we're going with this because it's not, it's working. But at the same time, it's not as fun, obviously. So... Well, actually, don't let, let's let's back up. So you say obviously because you've been experiencing it, but how would you describe the ways in which it's more fun to mix with speakers than than headphones? Well, or is that I, not, or my, is that not what you mean? No, I think it had to do with the idea that I had to chill out with volume because the first couple weeks listening and mixing on headphones, I was just enjoying the volume, and it was really messing with my tinnitus. Yeah. And I was starting to get like really bizarre, like equilibrium kind of feeling. And I think it was because I was spending 10 hours a day listening to way too loud stuff. So I had to learn, yeah. relearn how to mix at a very quiet volume. It's like you're in a band again, tracking in the studio all day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So doing that again. And I don't know, speakers, there's the air thing, but then I got used to that. And so I spent three months working on that. And then when I got back, and was sitting in front of my ATCs again. That was weird again. So mm -hmm. I had to relearn that again and try to figure out where's the center center. And so I think there's just a catch. There's a lot of people doing headphones even before COVID yeah. that are super pro dudes and they're fine. And I wouldn't mind doing it if I could find headphones that I loved as much as they translated, um, if that makes sense. Because it's been really difficult to find both. It's so, so are you saying that, um, cause I was very impressed with the Odyssey headphones as well, particularly with the, 
you know, the low frequency extension of them and stuff. Yeah. Um, and yeah. are you saying that the frequency response seems right, but maybe something about the experience just didn't have that uh, an excitement to it or something like that? Or well, something they, that just thrilled you when you were trying to make decisions? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it was, so I, that was always my first concern is how much low end can I get? Because if I can't right. hear low end, then I can't do what I do, right. which is half of my sound is the w- relationship of how much low end can I put into something. and. I need to hear that to understand what it's doing. And they did it great. I tried the LCD2s first, and those were way more fun to listen to. But they were they were really hard to hear, and I had to turn them up louder. And the Xs, as bright as they seemed, they weren't bright enough. So there was that like the economy of problems, just issues hmm. of going, this isn't this feels too bright. So I had to learn and relearn calibrate my head to not go past a certain high-end thing, knowing if I checked in the car, it wasn't going to sound like it's zippering. But right. the low end was always great because the, the 60 hertz on a kick drum was just perfect and bass and the reverbs were really pretty with the, the imaging. And it's funny, I didn't really get mm-hmm. into the universe of YouTube until like really, really, of what's happening and all these people doing review shows and stuff until COVID. And I could not believe the industry of just webcasters and headphone reviewers. I mean, there's Mm -hmm. like 30 dudes that just spend their living and life just sitting in front of a camera talking about headphones. And I watched a lot of those and try to figure out, well, that was probably... As a guy that's not an audiophile world, that's more of a critical world, I need to find something that does this. And I tried the Bayer Dynamics, which felt like my head was being torn off. <laughs> it was so bright. But somebody else loved it. So it's hard. It was, you just have to choose what... It's like you and I talked about with speakers. You have to settle with what you groove with, what you feel with. ATC, for me, when I got those, it was like game-changing because it was like falling in love with a girl the first time. Right. And it's been years since I've had them, and I still am just like nothing beats them because it was the two things translation every time, and I really enjoy listening to them. Do you want to know how I get a consistent sound quality mixing hundreds of episodes of Recording Studio Rockstars? Well, I've been cheating all along by using Isotope RX and Ozone on every single episode. Right now, you are hearing RX D-Click, D-Clip, D-S, D-Plosive, Voice D-Noise, Ozone Multiband Compression, EQ, and Limiting on my voice. If you want great, consistent mixes too, go to isotope.com slash rockstars and use the code ROCK10 to get an additional 10% off. Have you ever struggled to finish a mix wondering if it was truly ready for mastering? Wouldn't it be great to have a trusted coach walk you through the final stages of mixing so that you could confidently deliver your mix for professional mastering knowing that it was just right? At soundquarter.com, home of the iterative mastering process, Brian Murphy is your trusted coach to listen to your needs and help you get your mix ready for mastering. Contact Brian now for a free mix review and mastering demo at soundquarter.com. Do you remember, I know it's been a minute since you were dating your your speakers, but um, do you remember <laughs> the experience of like uh, arriving at that? Is there, is there something about it where you can't, can you know when you just go listen to them or do you actually have to work on them to know for a day to know how they, how well they're going to work for you? I well, guess, I guess you was... said that you kind of answered that because you said translate, which means you have to yeah. create something, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, for me, it was I spent years going to Doug Sachs mastering lab while he masters on ATC 150s. And every time he went or I went there and I heard them specific, it was just like I related to what was happening. Now, it didn't do a, and ATC is known for the bass isn't as bloomy and poofy as a lot of other speakers, but it was in a different universe, the mid range. And I call it the tennis ball which is the big mid-range cone on ATCs, and that's where it shines. 
And every time I would listen and master with Eric Boulanger or Doug Sachs or Sonny or Robert Hadley at the mastering lab, the speakers would always be like part of the treat for me. That's why I would always go to the session. Yeah. And it wasn't for before, the coffee. Yeah. With the good coffee up in Ojai for sure. Um, man, I didn't even think about that until you said that. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So the, the biggest scoop was just trying to figure out, um, what related. And I spent all these years just trying to find the best speaker for me. And I'm the kind of person that will probably go into debt if I find something that I love, but won't yeah. spend a dollar on it if I don't love it. Yeah. I can't, I can't be in the middle. So it was, I was, uh, 2014 or something. And I had to make a decision on selling some gear that I had in order to fund ATC 45s in 2014. And I think there was a gear post on gear slots of me saying, do you think it's worth it if I go and leave the analog universe and summing and I buy a pair of speakers that I know are a million percent and stay in the box? And all these people said no, which made me do it because I'm like, you know, this is, I already have to learn in the box because at the time it was time to kind of understand what was going on with it and learning it through an incredible DAC going into great speakers. It's, it's over. I mean, you, then you know what's going on and how to change it. So then when you add analog after it, you're just emphasizing it and making it better, which is my kind of setup now where my template is set up in a digital in the box and full summing with a click of an insert and it's all balanced and it's perfectly calibrated where I can go between it and here. Now what does that mean uh, full summing with a click of an insert? How does, how do we picture that? So I molt out my buses, I, my templates set up where I have 12 stereo or 14 stereo buses and each of those go Molted one to a digital bus and then one to stereo summing on the SSL Sigma out times 12. So that's 24 summing channels. Uh, and then it comes back in to, I used to have it go to the Josh Florian converter and now I'm just on a Orion HD because I think it sounds really shockingly good. Um, converter and then my playback DAC is a benchmark. Uh, but the way it's set up is I have a digital bus and an analog print bus. So when it comes back into the insert of that channel, it's the summing. So it goes to the Sigma, 24 channels, into a tube tech multiband, into an API EQ, and then back into digital stereo. And then I can throttle between the digital print and the analog digital print. And the reason why I do that is because I still use digital for stuff and usually it's trailer related or stuff that needs massive amounts of punch and clarity mm -hmm. then i just i skip the analog chain because it doesn't the analog chain really goofs it up in a good way but it really it, it rounds changes things it off yeah. yes exactly and sometimes i don't want that well, but i so also want it to be in real time let me say it back to you to see if i'm understanding so you you're um Submixing your mix so that it hits eight or sixteen stereo uh, submixes, something right? Okay, yeah. And yeah, then yeah. each of those submixes goes the output of that augs submix goes to a digital master bus track that you're printing a digital mix, but the output also goes out an analog out to your summing box. And then right. the stereo return of the summing box goes through the API EQ back into an analog print track in your session. Tube tech compressor to API EQ to digital print back. So Correct. then do you have a one button click where you can listen to digital versus uh, analog? Yes. And where's, yes. what's the, where's the one button? How do we picture so that? In the world of when I got into this and was working under Bill Schnee, and going and working under Doug Sachs and watching the whole approach of critical listening and understanding, you always want the least amount of signal between specific things. So mm. all my gear is hard patched. I don't have a patch bay. Um, it's short lines. My benchmark 
is my monitor controller because it has a volume on it. So that's a DAC that goes straight with the volume controller, which I believe okay. is just a digital controller that controls my speakers. But on that, I have an optical switch and I have a, um, a coax switch. So the coax is going straight to the digital converter. And if I want click it over to optical, that's actually either the digital print or my ref. So once I pick what I want, I assign my ref to that optical switch. So it's just a switch. Yeah, but it's, goes, on the swi- it's not a switch in Pro Tools, for example. It's on right. your volume controller. on your Right, it's on my DAC master. one yeah, on it. the benchmark. Okay, cool. That allows me to have you know a uniform, clean approach that I don't have to kind of scroll through. But sometimes now I've been actually just putting the ref track in my print track and then just unclicking the input on Pro Tools, and that will just engage the ref track, right, which helps right. too. I'm doing and more that, of that now when I'm mixing. I, I used to always bounce out, but I've re- more recently learned that if you print a track back into Pro Tools, you can take that, if the track's in record for the input, you can use the, you know, what is it, option K to go in and out of input, and you can hear what's already on your track versus what you're sending to it now instantly, which is very helpful. Yeah, it's there's a couple of, and it's all about speed too, because uh, what you're trying to do is, you know, I can get a mix together in ridiculous speed versus what I would be able to like eight years ago. And some people would be like, well, that's not fun. But I'm like, but I get to spend all of my extra time creating, right? experimenting, because I already have everything. It takes me, you know, 10 minutes to get a really great drum sound now because of my template. And it can be two or three different approaches. It's not always the same things. It's not the same sample. It's not the same bus compressor. Um, But once that's set, then I can spend a lot of time on different things and automation and the littler things that make records records, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. So um, we're we're doing this sub-mixing, busing thing. What are some of the instruments that are smart for us to bus together into these stereo buses? And do we want to actually put any treatments or plugins on those stereo buses that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I do a lot on those buses. So my sessions are usually full of kind of the things I want and and they're inactive on the buses, on the template. So, and I do, you know, per track, I'll EQ and do whatever they need it, if they need it. But most of the time, I do a little bit of compression or a little bit of EQ, like pads and synthesizers are always together, except for bass pads and synthesizers those are Mm -hmm. on their own bus guitars and acoustic guitars are together drums and percussion and effects depending on the effects so if it's trailer effects means you know doppler drops and taiko hits and all these super stuff that you hear like 30 hertz and massive amounts of low end so that goes his doppler drop go like Yeah, stuff like yeah, 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 and whams. And I hope you enjoyed my low frequency there of rock stars. There you go. Yours is so, much better, but yeah. you're you're an expert. Yeah. Okay. the The thing is to separate them just enough to be able to have some kind of control, because then I can pop up on my D command eight faders and then mix just the the, the buses, which right. are essentially VCAs at that point because you're just staying on the groups and I'm fine with that because I do internal rides separately anyways, but then the groups and a lot of that is fake strings and fake brass when you're doing, because the more and more high profile trailer work and stuff is a lot of it's fake and it's getting really good. sounding. But let me, let me ask you something to make sure we don't get off track here. You said Mm -hmm. it's essentially a VCA. Uh, It's just so we don't confuse it. We are routing all the audio through an actual AUGS bus and then mixing that, or we're... Yeah, yeah. I just meant in the sense that a lot of people used to do grouping on an SSL, Mm -hmm. and they would group everything. And this is essentially, for me, a similar approach, where all of my buses are grouped independently. So if it says DRM, that's the group of drums. It has its own group. Now, BCA and Pro Tools works off of a group. Mine are just auxes. I don't use VCAs, but they're set up in the sense that I can automate it 
I can do all the rides yeah. specifically on it. And I try to leave independently the volume controls on the independent tracks alone and just automate the trim. And specifically for that, it has to do with just keeping the freedom. I haven't been able to figure out one thing, which is I do drive, I get used to it, but I drive myself nuts where I have to hit group solo. I can't just hit the bus to listen to it. Oh, right, right. Well, I mean, now, of course, we have folder tracks, so that may change things a little bit, too. But oh, you you're saying, okay, so, so you're saying that um, the if you automate the trim, then you still got to go fader. You can just grab with your fingers and make it a little louder or softer without having to write it into your mix, in other words. Is that what you mean by, by that? Yeah. I mean, I, obviously, the vocal yeah. usually has a compressor on it, but then the lead vocal is its own bus. And if there's a double, it's in the lead vocal too. And I will compress both. But my vocal chain is usually three or four compressors in line anyways. It always has been for the yeah. last two years. It barely, half the time, I don't even think some of them are even compressing. Um, um, and then just to keep, make sure it's clear to everybody listening, um, you know, automation is beautiful because you can make you can write it in you know etch it in stone what you want to happen and and it, it'll do it every time but it sucks when sometimes you're like can't i just want to grab something and change it a little bit you know without having to think too hard about it and so i think that's clever what you did which is writing the automation on the trim fader which happens before the actual fader at the output where you can still just turn something up or down a little bit without having to think about it right yeah how many times have you had a drum set grouped and all you wanted was the hi-hat to come down a little bit and you can't it's locked and right. just i always I started doing that because somebody <laughs> pointed it out and i'm like oh my god what, what where is trim been my entire life yeah crazy um i think uh for me i it's funny like i a lot of my mixing actually takes place if i have let's say i have an ssl plug-in on a track i don't even go to the volume knob i just go to the output of the ssl plug-in and turn it up or right. down a little bit you know yeah, the but fader. it does feel a little silly to have to do that. API Audio has been designing mic pre's, compressors, and EQs for more than 50 years. Every product they make includes founder Saul Walker's original proprietary op amps and transformer designs to make sure you always get that legendary API sound in your studio. Whether you are writing songs for fun or mixing Grammy-winning hits, API has got you covered with individual modules, rack units, and dedicated consoles to make sure your next record is your very best. Go to API audio.com Sometimes you just need a mic that will stand out in a mix. That's when you need the new BB29 Signature Series from Jay-Z Microphones. The unique single diaphragm golden drop capsule gives the BB29 airy highs and smooth mid-range to help your tracks stand at the front of your mix. Jay-Z's handcrafted, fully discreet microphones come with a five-year warranty and free shipping to the U.S. You're hearing my voice on the BB29 right now. Use the limited time coupon ROCKSTARS to get 50% off the BB29 at jzmike.com. I mentioned uh, folder tracks, and you said, oh, I don't know, you have to tell me about that. So that's a new uh, feature in Pro Tools that, of course, has existed in some other DAWs as well, but it will let you take all the drums and you can sort of zip them all into a folder. Um, and there's two first versions of folder. I, th I forgot the exact terminology of them, but one I think is a, a routing folder. And that one sort of folderizes all the tracks, but it really creates that AUGS bus as well so that you can just take the fader and turn it up or down. But I don't think you can put plugins on the folder track yet. Um, you know, they need to get, what they need to get taken care of is, and I've been talking to Avid quite a bit through this whole thing with marketing department and stuff. And mm -hmm. they need to get two things together and they will be in better shape. One is, and maybe there is a way to do it, and please, somebody email me if you know a better way to batch output um, for stems while it's processing everything separately. A lot of it has to do with, if I'm using one outboard Bercasti, I have to print everything that touches that on my stem. I can't right. just have a dump that goes straight to a different aux that's printing while my master is printing. Unless I had a reverb attached to every single bus. 
this is the world that we live in that I think other companies have gotten figured out with an offline approach where it just does it in one fashion. Slate had a, a micro thing set up that I could never figure out properly, and maybe he'll figure it out eventually. Batch Commander, that was able to do that because now everyone's requesting stems on everything. Right. And it's just a pain in the, the butt. To Meaning get it you have to just accurate. do multiple prints. You have to go from the start to finish multiple times in order to print it because it's not routing things properly. Depending on the time frame I have, I can still take my digital prints and just do offline really fast per bus. And it takes literally four or five minutes to do the entire song. And then the only difference is then that's all digital prints and it's not the analog. If the the final, but most of the time they're wanting stems so they can alter it anyways, and it's going to be aggressive anyways. I mean, there's times where the last two years I was really dipping heavy into the production side of music and trailer world is insane because they'll literally buy out a song specifically for one drop or a piano point and then to take that from the stem and never incorporate anything else from the track. So we've just entered a new universe when it comes to that or what music editors and you know people that are in that universe are trying to just morph multiple songs into its own thing. It used to be where it's like, write this trailer for this song or for this uh, episode trailer. And okay, you write and you cut it towards it. And now these editors are taking like six or seven different cues songs Mm -hmm. and putting it into one new trailer. And it's becoming this like Q sheet is just uh, like five different songs, but one is only a kettle hit and then one is a piano boom, and that's it. And it's just really interesting to see the creative side, but then like you lose that all. So if you're doing a stereo mix for it or a surround mix for it, you get it right there. Half the time, they're not even going to use it. That happens in the movie side of stuff too. If you're placing a traditional song in it and they ask for stems, the music editor is going to end up mixing the song. That gets tricky, but lately in the last couple of things I've done, it's been, they've been really happy with just the stems that locks right back into the mix. And so mm-hmm. most of the time they'll just use the mix before there's dialogue. And then when there's dialogue, they'll bounce it out to the stems or they'll use like the stems for surround in the back or something like that. Well, that's some pretty advanced shit. It's a, it's a little hard for me to picture it all, but, um, just to uh, just in case this is what you were asking, were you saying that when you use the Bercasti, now we're talking about having to do an analog addition to the mix, so you can't do offline, right? And is that where the challenge comes in with doing your stems that you just had to yeah. print a bunch of versions of the song and it's time consuming? A lot of it is that. So there's ways around that. You know, Seventh Heaven makes their plugin, which is the Bercasti, and they you can literally clone the analog counterpart to the plugin. Mm -hmm. And I do that. And I've done that. And there's been times, and I told this to Seventh Heaven, that I actually, and it happened on Amanda. We were working on Amanda, which was this French film that we were working on about a year and a half ago. Anton Senko, composer, phenomenal composer, by the way, if you want to hear some great stuff. He's amazing. Right on. He, um, we were in a hurry because there was a deadline and we had to get stuff back. And I was in a position where I I had to get it out quick and I just popped in the plugin with the settings I had from the analog counterpart just to print stems out. And I was so, I mean, there is a difference. There is. And I can get into that another time, but it was so good that I actually finished the entire project with the plugin counterpart. So talking about stems, if you're running into that, I do have in my template a separate clone of the Burkasti with a plug-in counterpart. So if I pull up, let's say, um, Sunset Chamber on the Burkasti, the real thing, and I'm using that for a vocal, and I want to do stems, I actually have a clone of the Burkasti Sen Digital Aux that has the Seventh Heaven 
sunset chamber set exactly the same that's attached to the digital bus. So if I'm doing stems, it's the digital counterpart of that going to the vocal. I love the sunset sense. chamber. Was that the the uh, B chamber and B or something like that? I don't know. I you know I ended up mixing a record a couple of years ago and I came across it and I was just like, this is the biggest cheating reverb I've ever heard. Like this is cheating for like Americana <laughs> slow Ryan Adams kind of right. style. It was just Mac because probably because I know Ethan Johns did a lot of stuff at sunset. So you're probably hearing the sound of that and it's just making you wait. It's like what the Capitol chamber is, you know, or Abbey road chamber. Yeah. They're historically signatured sounds. Yeah. We, and your mind goes to that. We did, um, we did a record there for the living things and, um, we were in, I think it was A. If A is the room where your back is facing the street through the wall, and B is the smaller one right over it. I think A was the, the Van Halen room. Um, and if I'm mixing that up, anybody correct me. But, but B has the chamber right off the control room, and you can walk into it. And it's like, it's like the size of a bedroom. It just has great walls in it. And um, they had a pair of uh, RCA 44 mics in there. And God, it just sounded incredible if you fed anything through it. But um, well, that's oh, another. I mean, I could go on and on. Well, let just me talking l- about chambers and rooms, and I regret of not doing certain things when yeah. I could have, and yeah, just because that's I mean, we really should talk about that because everyone's going to have access to the same plugins, and we're trying to be unique here. And sounds are sounds, and I said this before. Always gravitate towards one thing that you implement in your mixes that is kind of your signature sound, but make it a little different than what everyone else is doing because you're trying to be independent as well. So if it's a reverb or if it's a real reverb, you make your own chamber with your shower or something, it's going to stick out. That's why I think a lot of those records in the 60s were so special because everyone had their own sounding chambers and they were Mm, all different. Good point. We did something in 2015 or 16 at East West and it was a reversion of the San Francisco song that we tracked in Studio 3, which was the Pet Sounds Room at East West. And wow. we had to tap into the chamber because the song, if you're going to San Francisco, everyone knows the song. And a lot of that is, a lot of that's chamber. And they used the same chamber and we pulled it up. And I'm like, this is not even close to the same sound. And then apparently it was very similar setup, but they had modern mics on it. So they put ended up putting the, an older pair of Dynamics in there with this Altec speaker, and it sounded really close. And it was so much closer to that. So even like the pickup, how what speaker you're using, powered Mackie monitor versus an old Altec, and you know microphones, like you said, Sunset probably uses ribbons or had ribbons when you were there. That's going to make a huge difference too. Yeah. Well, it, yeah, absolutely. Um, it reminds me of a funny story that Steve Albini uh, shared once about going to Abbey Road for the first time. And he was so excited to be there. And I think he was mastering um, a Kim Deal record over there or something like that. And um, he went in to go listen to the, to go see the chamber. And he walks into the chamber and and he's he's like walks up and he says, I kid you not, there was like the faintest sound of like love, love me do coming through the chamber. And I was like, what the what the hell is this doing? I mean, this is like, I know I'm in Abbey Road, but why would I hear the Beatles coming out? And it's because he happened to show up when they were all so they're, they're being remixed. Yeah. And so they're probably actually in the nineties for the anthology. Yep, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. <laughs> I actually talked to Jeff Emmerich about that before he died. So they rebuilt those chambers specifically for the anthology. Didn't they have to find the original paint and everything? Yeah, and it was never close to the same. So it's funny, if you listen to, and I was just listening to it working out yesterday, Anthology 2 or Anthology 3, the White Album stuff, and you listen to the Esher demos, they all have this glorious reverb on the vocals. Those are the chambers. But if you listen to the White Album remaster and the remixes, they don't have that really vibrant reverb on let's say happiness is a golden gun mm-hmm. or a, ha- a warm gun a golden gun would work gold finger happiness is a gold finger gun 
There if, you go. <laughs> if you listen to the anthology three of Happiness is demo versus the White Album remix of the same demo, you're going to hear the chamber on the anthology, and it's going to make it sound way better because the one on the remix on the on the 2019 remix was just like, eh, it was flat. It's great, but it made it sound cleaner, but didn't have that glorious chamber that added all this space and air. Wow. Really cool. Yeah. Well, it becomes part of the, it's an instrument, you know. During the height of record making, the Spectra 1964 100 series preamp was the perfect choice to build consoles for Tom Dowd, Muscle Shoals, Stack Studios, Ardent Studios, and New York City Record Plant. Bringing you the sound of ZZ Top, Aerosmith, Bruce Springsteen, King Crimson, John Lennon, and many more. The 100 series amplifiers offer extremely stable high-speed circuit design with unequaled headroom, low noise, and linear output, irrespective of transient audio peaks, giving you cleaner, punchier, dynamic dynamic recordings. The Spectra 1964 legacy is carried on today through Bill Cheney and Jim Romney. Now you can get that same incredible sound in your studio with the STX Mic Breeze, BBDI, and Comp Limiters. Go to Spectra1964.com or call 801-797-0642. You're hearing my voice right now on the Jay-Z BB29 microphone, the Spectra 1964 STX100, and C610 Comp Limiter. A gold bar should be kept safe in a vault because it's valuable, but it could be replaced if it was ever lost. One of your songs or recordings, on the other hand, is worth more than gold because it's one of a kind. It's you, and if it was ever lost, it could never be replaced. So wouldn't you feel better knowing your music was safe? This is why I like to have a dedicated system drive, audio work drive, virtual instrument storage drive, cloud storage, and an extra large backup drive in my studio computer. And when I'm finished with the project, I move it onto a dedicated pair of external drives for archiving. Thanks to OWC, I can count on my drives being super fast, reliable, and secure so that I can work quickly and sleep soundly at night knowing my music is safe. I want your music to be safe too. Discover the best options for storage and backup for your studio from OWC at maxsales.com slash rockstars. Have you ever wished you could remove the click track bleed from a singer's vocal mic, the sound of shuffling feet from a full choir, or clicking noises from the valves of an otherwise brilliant trumpet solo? These are just some of the incredible things I've been able to clean up, edit, or remove from a recording using the magic of Isotope RX. Great for mixing with a collection of plugins for your DAW to manage plosives, clicks, S's, noise, buzz, reverb, breaths, and even guitar fret squeaks with the set it and forget it simplicity that lets you you focus on your creativity in the studio while you let Isotope handle the audio challenges. If you've ever wanted to truly feel like a magician in the studio, then Isotope RX is your magic wand. Go to isotope.com slash rockstars in the show notes and use the code ROCK10 to get an additional 10% off your first purchase. Back to the Bricasti for one sec, and uh, I just wanted to share this in case this was something you didn't know about and would be a good solution for that. There is a tool that will help you speed up. Speed up just meaning you can leave the studio while it does offline bounces, and it's called Bounce Butler. And it's a third-party app made by Chris Graham, who's um, co-host over at Six Figure Home Studio. Another I think, have you podcast. interviewed him before? Yes, yeah. I remember us talking about that, and then I went and looked at his thing, and I never got past it. And well, I use and, it and now for get... the podcast. Because you know how right. long it takes me to do um, even an offline bounce? of, of I, I tend to batch my mixes together. So a um, little, little again, some behind the curtain here, but uh, I'll do 13 mixes all at once before a new quarter um, right. as part of, you know, doing these in advance. And in order to do, even do offline bouncing of that much, I have to lock out my studio for like 24 hours at least just to bounce them all out. Yeah. Um, and that bounce butler allows me to do that so I can actually cue them up and bounce it. So you could that could be a tool that would help you if you're trying to do a series of offline stems or an online uh, real time stems, and just you know not have to sit around for it. But you still have to kind of, you know, you kind of have to set them up ahead of time. It's like setting That's up your okay. bowling pins. Yeah, I mean it was like what we talked about the template. I mean it took me 
three years to kind of figure out what template I wanted. And, you know, after I got this Mac Pro, I had to like replace all these other plugins with Acoustic because that company, I don't know if you've had experience with those plugins. A little, but like everybody else, uh, my computer isn't fast enough to do much with them. So I just kind I of couldn't even run one on, on my 12 core without it just like freaking out. And now I can run at 96K, like 30. Wow. Before, and it's just like, okay. It might just be the, 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 um, the way that the new computers are finally managed and figured out that it works a little better, but they're magical. They really are silly. But, uh, you know, I was going to talk to somebody else about this because I was being asked. Because I've got, you know, we all have the same kind of, how many versions of SSL channel do you have? How many versions of plugin wise? How many versions of right. the LA3A plugin do you have? And it's funny because I still use all of them. Like I still use the old Waves SSL because I still think the top band on it sounds way different than UAD, way different than SSL's native pack that I have. Mm -hmm. way different than Plugin Alliance. And they're all different. But there's something to say that. It's the same thing as I think Tom Lord Algae saying he still uses the Bomb Factory 1176. I, I started some... using that more again. I, I, I saw it enough people great. use it great and get great results. And I was like, why am I not using that for some stuff? You know? Because you think it's better because of the GUI or... I don't yeah. know. I mean, yeah. I remember watching that video and being like no way but then like he went to his folder and he had every plugin known to the universe and he still clicked the bomb factory i think he was mixing a weezer song or something and i'm just like yep there's his sound it's got a little more snap it's not cleaner at all it sounded terrible if you wanted to be hi-fi it just sounded like snippy but that's the exact sound you want you can get it that way and yeah I think the rules of that are super important to think about. Same as converters and even down to microphones, because I've been with the lockdown and stuff, I've been doing stuff for some other companies and I did a show for Produce Like a Pro and stuff like that where I was gathering all this video setup and I was going through microphones and testing microphones and trying to find the best fit for all these things. And it's funny because 20 years in, you think, ah, I can get set up a nice setup and my audio is going to be fine. And it wasn't. It was like difficult and noise and fans and all the stuff that you take for granted when you're just casually sitting in your room. Mm -hmm. It's just, I mean, for you to be able to do it, you have to be locked into a specific room, you know, mm -hmm. or like the people that you're interviewing if they don't have a great setup, it's probably it's probably like what you and I were dealing with. And I'm like, how about now? And you're like, kind of. <laughs> how about now? That was for people kind asking. Of. That was a couple couple months ago trying to get the best. And I'm like handing, standing outside my house or where I was staying, like hanging over a cliff. How about now? <laughs> it's just <laughs> it's like one of those dumb cell phone commercials. Right? Yeah. But, you know, there's nothing wrong with the model microphones and Slate and um, the UAD one and stuff like that. But I'm still finding that, you know, I just mixed a song for a friend that has this really aggressive voice and he should have just sang it into an SM57. It would have sounded way better than him using the slate mic that had so much edginess to it anyways for his, his voice. Right, right. And who would have thought? And we forget, just like Bomb Factory, we forget that like it was good for the purpose then, and we're not talking like Pro Tools Mix Plus. Remember that system? Oh, yeah. I still got mine upstairs. Oh, man. I, I, I could, didn't have the heart to get rid of it. I got the full thing with the expansion bay and everything just sitting there. <laughs> the A88? The double, the dual mirror drive oh, Mac. Uh, yeah, so that sounds terrible, but if you listen to records that were done on it, like I think we can go back to Chicago era because you and I both talk about Chicago. Mm -hmm. You think about Summer Teeth. I talked to Mike Hagler. That's a guy you should definitely interview. I don't know what happened to Mike Hagler, King Size. The guy that did Summer Teeth, Wilco Summer Teeth. Yeah. He was like the Pro Tools guy in the 90s. 
And he ended up mixing Summer Teeth all in Pro Tools in the 90s on a Mix Plus system. And you listen to that record and it's like, it's got a sound. I know a lot of it was probably tracked on tape and transferred in or not, Mm -hmm. but it still has the sound. And I think a lot of people just forget just because it's new, it doesn't mean it's going to be better. Yeah, I've got records I did here at my studio um, that were done on the the old Pro (laughs) Tool system and tracked that way versus my HDX system. And the those ones done on the first system sound great. You know, it's it has to do with the music and the musical choices. Yeah, uh, it doesn't mean that it was the wrong move to get the new computer because now I'm doing a whole ton of other things that I couldn't do on the old computer. But um, but they're all useful useful tools if you know how to use them. Let's, it can go on and on. Let's talk more about your uh, template. Um, tell us some other things that go into it. Just Basically speaking, give us give us a little bit of an outline or a tour of the concept of your template before we even get into the details of what's in there. It's just simple. And it, there's not a lot of parallel processing. I have three or four inactive parallel auxes going, vocals and piano, mm-hmm. drums. And they usually stay off unless there's a song that's so dense and I just need more pop from something i'll pop in a parallel thing but it's really just simple it's groups of instruments dumping down to their own stereo bus that dumps into that usually has an eq or a compressor on those stereo that dumps into um a stereo master if it goes to summing or if it's digital now and i've said this i think the last time i do have about 20 stereo reverbs at all times in that template all going at once (laughs) yeah and they're all kind of set so one literally is called and they're all labeled so my bus isn't bus two it's long reverb or drum reverb or because it's specific to it's just a habit i've learned so working at crc starting um the engineers i learned off of uh you know there there's gus there was UB, Dennis Dusana, these great engineers that I just watched. They would always use the same reverb. It was 480 on everything. Right. And usually it was roughly the same sound, same setting, maybe a tiny bit of pre-delay difference. And then going and working under Bill Schnee, he used two or three different things, but mainly his sound was his really special plates, which were magic. And Toby Foster modded those guys and just, you can't even... You can't even imagine how great they yeah. sound. They're so unbelievable. But, you know, other than the decay time, it was relatively that. So I kind of was like, okay, I don't need 30 different reverbs on a song. I just need to have 30 different reverbs set up. Yeah. In Look. terms of if I'm like, I want reverb to sound like back sea change, that really dense, long, six, seven second right. decay you got, reverb. You got one just called sea change. I have one called Long Reap, right, (laughs) which I actually use on vocals that are like that or like tambourine hits and stuff that needs that super dense reverb. But then, but it's always there, but it's catered off of what I think it needs. So I still use, and I've said this a couple of times, I still use after 15 years, I have this 480 uh, IR impulse of Music Club C. And it sounds way different than the real 480 Music Club C. It sounds way different than the Relab 480 and the UAD 480. And it's just like really brittle, short. And it reminds me of, you know, Tom Lord at LG Records or something in the 90s. Really good on snare, just like that really yeah on the snare. And I that's what I use still if I need that over like the UAD 480 specific because it sounds way different. And I don't know if that's a, it's kind of going back to the bomb factor. It doesn't matter. But there's other options that I have on my stereo bus that, uh, you know, are kind of staples to the sound that I use. And one of them specifically, I don't even touch. I just engage it, which is the API 560 universal audio EQ. Even though I use a 5500 analog, 
it still does something super bizarre with the stereo imaging of a mix. It doesn't EQ it. It EQs it, obviously, because it's changing, but it's more about where the drums end up going when you engage it. It's bizarre. I'm wondering if it's modeling the 2520 op-amp, because I'm not touching EQ on it. And, and the 550 is the, is the, that's the graphic EQ, right? The 550 is Or is two, it the 560? The 560 is the graphic. Okay. Yeah. This, the 550 is the stereo kind of mastering version of their EQ um, of the, the 500. Right. Series. And then we have the, the um, is it the five, apologies for not having all my model numbers in front of me, but 550 and then the 550A, are those the like three band and four band versions? Or am I Yeah, this is a four too? band and then it, it has the range. So I can go 0.5 or I can do 0.25 if I want to get really delicate. Because nice. the steps on an API is two dB steps. Right, they're they're kind so of bold. Just, yeah, if I want to do it less, I can just pop in the range. I just leave them on. But nice. a lot of it is just understanding how to get certain things out of it. So I can't, for the life of me, find something in in the box that does like what the Sigma does. And I only use the Sigma for summing. I don't use it as inserts or anything that it's made for, which is crazy how expensive it was. It was made as a mixer and not just a summer. It had inserts and different levels on things and plug-in controls and stuff. I just keep it on at Unity and don't touch it. And I can't find anything that does what it does in the plug-in world. And the same thing is I can't find anything in the analog world that does what a UAD 560 EQ just engage does. Because it's it might break it, but it breaks it as in the mix breaking, changing in a way that it always seems to work. Because I've always had a struggling thing about my drums being too loud. I had an obsession with Fleetwood Mac when I grew up. So, of course, snare drums are always going to be too loud. <laughs> um, paid off, I guess, when the reissue came out and got a chance to mix that. But right on. I still feel like most people are like, turn the snare down for dB. This seems to help that for me because it puts the drums backwards from a vocal and a different, it just shifts things around in a pleasant way. And I leave that off roughly well, until. How old are you, Mark? 38. I, 38, I, okay. so I you, couldn't even, I almost said 27. We can't <laughs> blame it on growing up in the 70s like, like I can. Right. 38. How is that possible? <laughs> I just, you know, I feel like once you once you grow a love and appreciation for a snare drum, you're just going to want it to be loud and mixes, you know, <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> well, it sounds better. The problem we've come up with is limiting destroys it. So if you want volume on your record, whoever's mastering it, mm -hmm. say goodbye to your snare drum. Mm. And I used to do tests all the time where I'd send stuff like with a snare up 3 dB on purpose just to see... If it got cut off with some cheese, and Doug Sachs used to call limiting cheese. Mm -hmm. So if you put cheese on it, it would cut off the snare. But maybe since you raised it 3 dB, it's it's louder than if it was below it. I, I'm, it was always I, I, I haven't heard Doug say that, and he hasn't told me this, but but I'm going to run with that in a sec for a second. Just say it's the idea that if you just put cheese on something, more people are generally going to like it more often. <laughs> I, I miss <laughs> cheese pizza. There you go. PreSonus has everything you need for your music or podcast production. Studio One is a great choice for your DAW, whether you are writing songs, creating EDM and pop music, recording bands, mixing, mastering, composing for film, or recording voice, and producing a podcast of your own. A flexible sketch pad, chord charts, key recognition, effects pedals, amp simulators, virtual instruments, including a killer drum machine, built-in vocal tuning with Melodyne, and 37 fantastic sounding plugins for mixing will allow you to create whatever inspires you. PreSonus provides you everything you need for your studio from microphone to digital interface to headphones and speakers so that you can easily set up your home studio for professional production. Get started now with the low-cost Studio One artist and join PreSonus Sphere for access to all their software, a complete learning library, and creative collaboration in the community at PreSonus, wherever sound takes you.
If your goal was to climb Mount Everest, you would hire a Sherpa to guide you to the summit. If you wanted to sail around the world, you would hire a seasoned sea captain for a safe voyage. And if you wanted to try skydiving, you wouldn't just jump out of an airplane without being strapped to an expert, right? So why would you send off your mix for mastering without knowing that it was ready first? Wouldn't it be great to have a professional mastering engineer with a trained ear to guide you through the final stages of mixing? Brian Murphy is your trusted guide at soundporter.com, home of the iterative mastering process, where you get to interact with a professional mastering engineer who listens to what you want and will give you mix feedback to help you get your mix ready for mastering. Contact Brian now for a free mix review and mastering demo so that you can hear it before you buy it at soundporter.com. Well, very cool. All right, so let me let me back up for a sec. So, you've got uh, your template set up where you've got uh, individual tracks. You have a ton of reverbs that are ready to go. You've done a very clever thing, and you've said, "I'm going to instead of worrying about which reverb plugin it is or or that kind of stuff, I'm just going to say, hey, which what reverb sound am I going for most often? And for me, it would be like what you said, like me." Sometimes it's a short ambient space. Sometimes it's that long sea changes reverb. Sometimes it's just the splash of a rock and snare thing. And why not just call that track, you know, snare verb and just have it ready to go? Um, and I'm also going to say that sometimes I think as an engineer, or as a studio mixer or whatever, we get we might get caught up and go like, whoa, why would we, you know, use one sound? And it's like, well, why wouldn't we use one reverb snare sound and um, and let that build off there? We use, you know, we'll we'll choose a snare drum for part of the drum kit. I mean, snare drums aren't that wildly different from each other. It's still a snare drum. <laughs> so why can't our effects be a little bit like that too, where they're appropriate? They are. They don't always stay the same. But I mean, I just do with what works and. I guess just experimenting on a ton and ton of things, I find what works. And I know a lot of people like to get crazy and, oh, I use this VCA compressor on rock and this tube compressor on jazz. And I'm just like, why not just use both if you can find it? And there are times when I'll just leave, like the SSL thing really does knock off transient and it softens things to the point where some people are really put off by that like i just did a rock mix and they said the drums lost all its power i said well you're listening to it in a way that you're comparing don't even listen to the reference first off because your reference isn't even close to what i did it's just very different sounding your drums mm -hmm. are very different sounding mm -hmm. take a step away from it the demoitis has caused this industry to catch on fire because everyone has which is it's you know there's nothing wrong with that but you got to be you know we spend more time kind of enhancing rough mixes right. than being creative because a lot of people get sucked into the rough mix after spending 20 weeks on something yeah but like what happened with the solid state it does soften things up and took some top end off and the snare wasn't as pokey but if you just took a second and stopped a being it in real time, you'd realize that it didn't. It just shifted things in a different way. And so, of course, he came back a couple of days later and said, "You're right. I did not need to listen to the others because the other was too bright." And now I realize it. That's why it sounded better. And we all know half dB, one dB will always win on anything. One dB louder, one one dB brighter, and I don't know. We yeah. got to get away from that universe of A being. I do it all the time, but I do it with ref just to get it to its matching place. And then I enhance from there. Yeah. I think Michael Brower calls it may I or something match and enhance or match and improve, which is a great concept because that's where it's fun because you know you're going to end up getting your client or whoever that's used to the reference excited because you're doing basically what they're doing with some added bells and whistles yeah yeah meet it and beat it <laughs> you know, there you beat go the mix um all right cool well so then you you take these uh you've got all these reverbs and they're they're probably all just 
uh, bypass parallel tracks as well for parallel processing until you decide you want to use one or need one. Um, what tips do you have for us about parallel processing? Because I think sometimes the place we're getting um, bit in the ass and we didn't even know it is the fact that, you know, not maybe not all parallel plugins are created equally. You know, if you put it on a parallel thing, it might come back and be kind of phasey against the original signal. Yeah. Whereas in the analog world, you know, you could kind of patch anything in parallel and mix it in. It sounds pretty cool, you know, not always, but a lot of times. No, no, I, I agree. I, I think that's what caused me to abandon the parade of people following that because it was scared me. And I started realizing that you're losing punch super fast with all this parallel. Um, I even think Chad Blake ended up saying something like, I don't care that it's doing that because I'll approach it knowing it's doing that. I'll have to hear it. So it's all about listening and mm -hmm. seeing. Because what can happen is you can put a waves, Chris Lord Algae, LA-2A, and then below it put a UAD, LA-2A, and then inactive one, and this can be your parallel. And it'll sound completely different because the waves is phasing with 5K. And then the bottom one is phasing with 200 hertz. Mm -hmm. So it's going to make relative what you do. So I think someone like Chad Blake, who just spent a ton of time understanding what all these things do, and he stays around the same too, where he knows where he, he can go with certain plugins and what it will do. Sometimes delay compensations off on a session, and I don't even realize it till halfway done. Oh God! And I'm like, <laughs> something is not right, and it's not far off. It's just not right, and then instinctively go there, and then all of a sudden it's just done, and it's fine. But then you like spend all this time getting drums in phase with phase buttons and stuff, and then by the time you hit the delay comp back into into play, you're back to square one. Yeah. Well, so, and the other place that bites me in the butt is uh, I'll sit there and do a static balanced mix and get all ready. And I'm like, great, I'm going to go into automation. And then you're like, why in the world did Pro Tools disable all my automation parameters? Now I'm terrified to turn it on because it's going to just like blow my static mix, you know? Exactly. Yeah, I can't. <laughs> it's, I don't understand it. There's a lot of things. It's a computer. And... You know, I had some weird issues where I was talking to one of the guys at Avid last week about when I hit the space bar and stop it, it would clip, it would click, and they couldn't figure it out. But then I searched and somebody else, of course, had it, and then he had a video on it online and never figured it out. There's just so many little bugs. I mean, there's the weird bugs where just it's been like that since version 5. I got on Pro Tools on version 5 in 2000. And it's the same bug that's been yep. there since then. And it's better. We are way better than it was, but there's still issues. And you just got to get past those things and understand where that's going. Here's one that um, I think most people are not aware of, and it's been around the whole time. So if you have a track with audio on it and you've chopped it up and it's, it's, you know, it's edited together, and, you, and then you think, well, why don't I select the whole thing and say consolidate audio? That should just be a duplicate of what's there. It's not even processing. It's not going through plugins. It's just con should be a consolidated duplicate of the original raw audio, but now it's all connected together. That yeah. changes the sound. Yeah. And it always has. And if you consolidate it and then you quickly give yourself that, that A-B listening... Knew, you'll yeah. you'll hear the difference. It loses a little bit of clarity and top end and all that and transparency. But the same as you know, this was a big thing. Not to get into too many things, but I do remember. By the way, did you get a chance to get with Bill Schnee? Did you do an yeah, interview? Yeah, Bill's going to be. Uh, he'll be. Uh, he will have been on the podcast before your interview comes out as well. Oh, great! He's he was. He was amazing. awesome. Oh, he's one of my favorite humans in the world. He yeah. was doing a Sergio Mendez record in 2007, I think so. And there was a Fergie song, and I tuned the Fergie vocal with Digital Performer. And there was a comment 
And this still reminds me of it because I didn't understand it at the time. Because at the time, I, I used Melodyne was just out, mm-hmm. and we had it in Chicago when I was there. And it was just buggy. And I didn't really understand how Antares worked with the, the manual tuning. So I didn't use that. And I just used the uh, digital performer tuning, which I still think is excellent and sonically good because for some reason it doesn't touch the audio unless you tune it. Oh, that's this good. Is, this is getting back to Melodyne. You put on Melodyne and it touches everything. So if you don't only tune like two words in the chorus, it's affecting the entire vocal. Right. So what happened with that thing, that Sergio record, it was Fergie and she didn't have, it just didn't have the sound that she was known for. I guess it was like the really aggressive tuning thing. And there was some comments about that. And it goes back to like we're talking now about like affecting audio and how it interprets somebody's opinion. So you can literally tune a chorus and let's say you only tune two words and you leave the audio track and you duplicate it and then you tune those words and then you just cut that part out of the duplicate. And so it's just tuning that words. You're going to retain the quality versus if you don't. Right. Because what, I don't know why, but like Melodyne really almost adds like an MP3 sound, even just processing it flat. It degrades it, just like consolidating. And I do remember recreating the sound. Melodyne is essentially, I think, a form of synthesis that takes your original and resynthesizes it into. Okay. Something that can be manipulated, I think. It's incredible what it does, but at the same time, it can really mess up S's on vocals. Yeah. And the other thing is, you know, pop filters and how much that really messes up S's on vocals and the body of a vocal because half of, like right now, I'm not talking into a pop filter. And if I did, it would probably sound like this or something like that. It's just, it, it little things like that add up. Mm-hmm. And going back to the Bill Schnee thing, I learned all of that from him about the littlest things being very hypercritical about the littlest things add up and they really add up. I mean, immensely because, you know, and you also have to just trust things and listen. Cause I remember when I was watching him mix bass guitar, cause at that time I didn't understand it. And he literally, I don't know, he probably won't remember him saying this to me, but he literally said, just, bass guitar. I trust it because half the time I never saw him EQ anything on a bass guitar. It was more balance and how he would put it in and out of the mix. And that stuck with me because before then I was EQing the absolute crap out of the bottom end of a bass to get it to fit Mm -hmm. in a song. Instead of hearing your environment and trusting your environment and knowing that a bass is, if it's recorded properly, it's fine. There's no weird nulls and stuff unless it's totally broken. Well, let's not forget played properly. Exactly. Right. But I think once I started trusting it, that's when it became, it started translating more. So there's all these little things that happen naturally once you start going into the critical listening universe, which I know that they're teaching at like Blackbird and stuff, the critical side of things, because I know Mark Rubo is pushing for these little elements that I don't think was ever being pushed in when I was like in school or like full sail. Yeah, we didn't do a lot of critical listening. I mean, we we would go in and have listening sessions and stuff like that. And I think my peers and I just did that out of the love of making music and recording. We'd go listen to stuff. But um, I don't think anybody was teaching us how to do that. Yeah, I mean, it's I, I give it all to those two men, Bill Schnee and Doug Sachs, of understanding just to let things go when they need to go and don't trust meters, listen to it. Doesn't matter if it's compressed or not, listen to it. It wasn't all stuffy audiophile shit. It was really just honest, good answers to problem solving Mm -hmm. and understanding what things are doing and understanding the frequency responses of all these different instruments and how that can mess up. That's why I just don't get into like side chaining and parallel compression because it, it, it works. It really does work. But half the time, you don't need to do that if you just understand your system and understand your speakers and know it to the point where you know it. 
And then the extra goodies come in and then you you do stuff that you can't do. Well, I think you pointed out too that all the the trickier processing things, they do work and they do change things. But what happens is you you have to really train yourself to pick up on the ways that it's, you know, it might be enhancing some excitement in a, in a you know, a harmonic saturated upper mid range but you might not notice very quickly that it just killed the low end or the impact on something and uh and so that i think is you know the the real sweet spot of balancing and maybe that's partly what um chad's saying too is if you just start with those tools then you push things into it you know just um and you're always hearing what it's doing to everything well i took his philosophy of samples and I, I I like samples. I, I'm not going to lie. I love drum samples because it can do certain things that you can never do. And it's not cheating. I used to get in these little arguments with <laughs> guys. If you're listening, you know exactly who you are that would say that it's cheating. And I just take it in the pr- process of it being an EQ or a compressor or a transient designer. Because what I'm doing is taking elements from that sample. I'm not replacing the snare with that one sample. I'm using it because it has amazing 110 hertz. Right. Or has amazing 20 hertz. Right? Like Chad Blake would always use, or he would use specifically a Dremagog kick that came with the, the package. And then he would use a slate on something else. But the Dremagog kick with the package and the time delay on that specific plugin was perfect for him to get the subsonic thing that he always needs out of it, but still using and augmenting. For the kick. And job. for the kick, yeah. And you know, I it's like Andy Wallace triggering reverbs off samples and using that as your po- push point for samples. And I tend to just see it as another option. And without having to spend terrible amount of time, I do it just like the reverbs, where in my head I'm like, I want it to sound like semi-sonic. Okay, semi-sonic has this kind of snare drum. I know where that snare drum is. Okay, put that in there. And then I'm grabbing the 150 hertz from that snare or emphasizing it because I chose that. Or like the incredible snappy transient snap of this other snare sample that you don't get from the snare you have. Yeah. It's not necessarily replacing it because that's when it just starts sounding like throat throttle shooting shotgun da, 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 you know just yeah it snare, snare replacement is tricky very I feel, tricky I feel like it was easier to get away with kick replacement first and harder to get away with snare replacement or the snare has to be really tucked low in there or something or maybe like I what you just, said it's easier to get the low the low frequency added to it yeah i just talked to bill hmm. schnee about that if he was still using app trigger versus slate trigger there was a company called app trigger that he used back in the day Mm. and i think they didn't update for os but i think they're they are now and it was the only one that at the time when you do a double kick or it didn't have that lagging thing that trigger seems to do it just didn't sound it sounds like it's a little millisecond off on the first hit or something and that's the hard part so that's when you want to use, you know, the real guy as like the weight of the instrument and just the attack on the other things. Nice. The secret to a great mix is to start with great source tracks. And this means you need great microphones. Jay-Z Mics in Riga, Latvia brings you the new BB29 Signature Series microphone to help your recordings add clarity and detail to your mixes. At the heart of Jay-Z Microphones is the unique Golden Drop capsule design with a lighter, faster diaphragm that delivers great clarity and fidelity without distracting colorations and distortions. The new BB29 microphone has a Class A discrete amplifier fire circuit, extremely low self-noise, and transformer-coupled output to bring an expensive sound to your studio for an affordable price. Jay-Z offers a five-year warranty, free shipping to the U.S., and a 30-day money-back guarantee. Plus, for a limited time, you can use the coupon code ROCKSTARS to get 50% off the BB29 at jzmike.com. 
The legendary API sound can be described as punchy and bold with a distinct in-your-face presence. For more than 50 years, API Audio has been advancing their design of consoles, mic preamps, compressors, and EQs. But what API founder Saul Walker got perfect in the very beginning were the proprietary op amp and transformer designs. And today, API still offers the very best for your studio with dedicated rack units for mic pre, EQ, and compression, and consoles from small to large with the Box 1608, 2448, or full size legacy access, and they even introduced the original 500 series lunchbox to studios everywhere. But most importantly of all, no matter which gear you choose from API, you can count on the original op amps and transformer designs to make sure you always get that legendary API sound. Because the next record you make could be your best record ever. Visit apiaudio.com. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Rockstars of Drums will show you how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Want to start mastering your own records? Rockstars of Mastering walks you through exactly how I mastered my own record using nothing but plugins in PreSona Studio One. Want to learn how to create a mix that doesn't suck but rocks instead? At Mix Master Bundle, I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins so that you can have punchy, powerful drums drums, guitars that rock, bass you can feel, and a mix that is in your face. Plus, it's totally free as my way of saying thanks for listening. Then go to MixMasterBundle.com to get started for free now and look for the clickable link in the show notes below. Well, let's see. What what uh, what should we go into? I mean, I guess we're probably coming to a close here too. Sure. Um, anything yeah, about ten minutes? Yeah. Anything minutes. I didn't ask you about your template yet? You were you were kind of talking about the two mix. Um, I use an ATR and the five sixty, and that's pretty much it. Other than my insert analog insert, um, I've been fooling around with the Acoustica stuff more because i can now um i have relatively all of the plugins that i need on across the board on the companies and i haven't even really gotten deep into a lot of them on the two bus i've tried virtual summing through three or four different manufacturing companies it mm -hmm. doesn't do what i want it softens top end and frequency response of the transient and mm -hmm. i feel like in a different way I just, I don't know. Yeah. I think the biggest thing for me is, you know, going from the album world and then getting into score world and then getting into trailer world. And it's a very different universe, but I, I taken so much from the album world and pulled it into score world and trailer world that it really shines well. Now, now I will ask you this. If you're going to mix an album for a band versus mix a score, you must be starting with totally different templates for those, right? It's not the same yeah. template? Yeah, it's about the same, except for the outputs, because those are set for stems in a very different way. And I usually right. rarely have drums, unless it's like a normal... Some scores have drums. Right, so, that, so that, musical treatments might be similar, but the stemming is totally different. Well, it's usually based off of... I, would, I usually don't even use analog on score, because it's... It's too vibey for my taste, and there's a lot of focus you have to deal with with automation and enhancing, and it just gets really sticky. Now, that being said, I would definitely use an analog reverb. If I had a reverb I wanted to use, I would definitely um, use a similar compression if I needed it, but scores don't like compressors usually, depending on what it is, you know, like that Ukraine film. That was interesting because it was very kind of timeless jazz, older stuff alongside real big 30-piece, 40-piece orchestra sections. And I would have to jump between mixing a pop record basically without vocals for part of the score to score score, which is strictly 30-piece orchestra with maybe a Tycho or maybe a timpani or something. But which are completely different than trailer. Trailer, imagine having score, EDM, rock, 
it all combined and it needs to sound all alike all of them and you're mixing from within the music too because you're having to mix the stems of the music or you're creating the music no just mixing it um just the hardest part the music, is right. yeah as trailer universe versus a score it's super different because you're getting three four hundred tracks on a right trailer. so so um oh you're talking creative like no like well, i'm just i'm just I'm just understanding what you're describing. So in the trailer mixing world, when when you're doing this, you're not mixing the sound effects and the voice so much. You're you're focused on the music and they're handing and they've grabbed seven styles of music for you to put together into this one music. No, that would be the that editor. The trailer. Yeah, whoever is supervisor on the trailer or the editor would actually combine and pull. Because what they're doing now is they're just pulling all these temps and sometimes they say okay make a sound alike like this temp right and then sometimes they're saying okay take the piano from the temp since we can license that piano and then let's use because it's in the same key and roughly the same tempo let's use the orchestra from this cue mm-hmm. and let's pull this the orchestra stem that's usually just the supervision and the editor what i'm doing is working strictly with a company like a glory oath and blood that is building songs from scratch and tracking them properly. I mean, Robert Bennett at glory oath and blood tracks all his stuff at Abbey road and air and London and stuff like that to get optimal sound mm-hmm. on it to kind of go above a lot of these counterpart companies that really don't get it, that you still want that, that real sound. You're going to have to go for it for real. Yeah. It does pay off because usually you land the big placement. The action film stuff really likes that. But after that's done, then you do, I just move on to the next song when somebody else is going to go and mix. You know, when I worked for Alcon, we did a little bit of, you know, creating our own trailers based off of cues and stuff because that was working for the film company specifically. It was just a little different field in a different area. Right but I, I'd rather just mix the song. So if they sent me 300 tracks on one cue, you know, a three-minute piece, and it's got a full big orchestra and a full big brass section and tons of synthesized, tons of drums and kettle and percussion and fake, all fake, all real. Mm-hmm. You know, fake is important these days because it's part of the sound now to blend fake orchestra with real orchestra and it's its own sound. So it's just understanding the philosophy of that balance. And I believe it's all transient response because for some reason, everywhere else has come down in volume, right? Spotify, and YouTube, Apple Music, the volume is not so loud on a record. You're right. But trailer is still, everyone wants it at ne- negative four RMS. <laughs> <That's something laughs> insane. And it's just competing so that, that if you're turning it into another you know team they want it to be the loudest thing when it ports into the picture and so when you're mixing this 300 tracks do you have dialogue and sound effects as well or do you just have the picture and no, you're just doing music it's usually to the just and sometimes i don't even have picture you know if they're building it specifically for a, a library content if they're putting out a, an album let's say it has 16 songs in the vein of this style action thing um, that's, that's usually an easier approach because it's like mixing an album. They'll send you 16 songs and they, okay, you got to mix this. And it's obviously going to all sound like, uh, X-Men or something like that. And that's great because that's where that's going to end up going. And eventually the supervisor or editor is going to pull from that. Then there's times when they'll specifically have the trailer done and then they will have the composer write to the picture and then you go and deal with that because it's a different entity and i'm dealing with that on two things right now if somebody was fascinated by this and curious and you know somebody's listening and they they're like man i love the sound of trailers where where would somebody or how would somebody get started in something like that where's a good place to begin to enter that that world. I would say just go to like APM 
or Warner Chapel Production Music or Universal Music Group and just listen to their trailer records and try to understand what it's doing. The problem with that is it's evolving. So every year there's a trend. Sometimes it's instruments, sometimes it's sonic. Mm -hmm. And you have to kind of keep on that. Um, I lucked out, had a good chance to work with Robert Bennett at Glory Within Blood a lot. I did a lot of mixes for him and a lot of mastering Mm -hmm. on his projects too. And I kind of didn't understand it in the beginning. And it took a lot of time for me to kind of get. But then I realized it's all about hypercritical listening and definition because I was getting mixes specifically on these trailers or asked to do it specifically because I was able to get it cleaner sounding, but bigger sounding, louder. Yeah. And it's not about compression and it's not about certain things. So all of the, the rules I learned about gain staging and loudness and size and everything that I learned paid off because in trailer, you'd think you would never pay off. But that's essentially all you're doing is making it bigger sounding than everyone else. Yeah. The low end extends bigger. It's not about compression. Everyone thinks of that when they think of trailer music. It's just this compression. It's not. I barely use compression on trailer. <laughs> barely. I mean, you should see my limiter. It's just pulverized in red. <laughs> it's just, I, I got to turn it off because if people saw what my fab filter limiter was doing on some of these things, you would just be like, is this real life? Because I'm, I'm pulverizing it. Because <laughs> it's basically clipping the hell out of stuff. Right. So you're not really compressing the sounds. You're just sending them straight to the output and they, and they can hit the limiter boldly at that point because they've got <sighs> lots of transient. I think that, well, that's most of what trailer is. So you, you get the look ahead limiter versus a compressor. You're saving yourself a lot of color. By doing that, giving away all my tricks. That's all right. Do you feel like the time you spent watching YouTube videos, trying out mix tricks, and tweaking version after version of your mixes has gotten you nowhere? Have you been looking for a simple, straightforward, step-by-step process for creating a pro mix that won't take years to learn? What if you could have a Grammy-winning mix engineer who understood all your mixing struggles and could coach you through them? If you struggle with any of these questions, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is just for you. Now you can discover the proven step-by-step mix system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating a pro-quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. Listen, I appreciate you listening to this podcast, and I know you're trying to make your best record ever. But when you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy-winning quality, then you're ready for UltimateMixingMasterclass.com. Well, Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure having you back on the show, man. I'm glad you're doing well. You're making these killer trailers, rock stars. Of course, we've got a, a playlist in the show notes, so just click through there and you can check it out and go listen to Mark's work and, and check out some of these amazing sounding um, movie trailers as well. Where can they go? Uh, where would you like them to go to learn more about you and follow your work and you know, reach out to you to make their next record? Um, I can just go to my website at markdanielnelson.com. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I need to update that sucker. But I, yeah, I mean, I get a lot of reach outs from people directly from there. There's a little email thing that you can contact. Very cool. If, if you'd like. Very cool. Well, Groovy, dude. Well, um, let me ask you one other closing question here, too. I, I kind of skipped it. Um, this is the hypothetical question I asked you last time, but we'll we'll put it in the context of mixing trailers um, and templates and mixing in quarantine, perhaps. Um, if you could go back in time and give yourself a, one bit of advice and you say, look, Mark, I know you're about to mix all these trailers. You're about to learn templates and, and uh, have your portable rig and mixing headphones and all that. But here's the most important, here's the one single thing I want to tell you that will help you be a rock star of the studio later. What advice would you go back and give yourself? Well, there's two things. One is attitude. And that's like an upward slope for anybody. You have to learn how to take criticism very well. You have to learn how to be accepting to the surroundings of creativity when you're working in a creative environment. And even 
I still deal with it because I, I mean, I'm mixing and I feel like I'm adding creative elements. So sometimes if someone hates what I do, you just got to learn that it's okay. Yeah. And you're building it as a team. And so there's a lot of young guys that just have no idea how to handle that kind of thing. There's always going to be a next project. You're always going to work on something after it. So if you don't get what you want, I learned that years ago. I was really stubborn when I was young. And that was the one big thing that, you know, you got to constantly learn. The other thing is always keeping up with technology and system ways to always be ready. Now, if I randomly didn't do my setup before COVID the way I did, I would have never been able to do the projects when I got the calls in Washington to do what I was being asked. Because it wasn't about having a Pro Tool system on a laptop. It was about being able to replicate my sound 100%. Mm-hmm. So you, your, and, your main, I mean, your your Mac Pro was mobile and I didn't even get that well. until like three weeks ago or a month ago. So that came after because I finally was like, okay, I've got to do this. Everyone was talking about the next one. I'll get the next one, you know? And I'm like, this where it's never going to end. <laughs> the key is just to be ready because you you get your calls. And it might not be a paid call, but it's going to be a call where the, someone needs you and you need to be ready. And that's the two biggest pieces of advice that I've been given and I can always relay on. Always be ready. Always be prepared. And then... Humble. Try working as a partnership with everyone versus it being your way or the highway. And I can't stress that enough because I don't mind doing mixed notes. I remember years ago, I used to get notes and I just get so frustrated because I would take offense like personally by it. Like, what do you mean you don't like my kick drum? I don't get it. I think it sounds great. But it's not about that. It's about what their vision is. And if you can work towards it, it's going to work out. I mean, I can't tell you the repeated albums I work with people that have massive notes every time. And it is sometimes it hurts when you get like 30 notes. But if you do it and they're like, perfect, after it, then you realize it's their vision anyway. So they're going to call you the next time. Yeah. Always. They always do if you listen to them. So the key is the two things is be ready. And then the other one is just be part of a team. Just be ready to just like be part of a creative team. And if I had to really learn about like not caring about the overall sonic thing of each instrument as much as I used to and cared about the overall presentation of a song. Yeah. Because I can sit there and cut around a drum set and get the drum sounding great. But if I if it doesn't sit with the rest of the things, it doesn't matter. So it's all about the creating of the whole song. So if I'm not even focusing on background vocals and it's the last thing I care about, but the guy that did it wants it to be perfect, it's going to instantly make me go, well, that's fine. Because I instinctively didn't put a ton of time into it. But if he says push it, it usually works out, even if his choices were weird. And it usually makes it better. And then you learn tolerance and you learn all these really good lessons about control and passion and all these cool things that you got out of it if you didn't if you just got your way or if they're just like this is perfect i don't like getting like high five right away and it's perfect great i feel like there's no way around that i feel really good with creative criticism yeah i've, I've just, actually had worse luck at the times when an artist comes back and they're like, yeah, it sounds great. And That's I mean, what I mean. They later on, I'm like, oh, I screwed else. up the low end. How did, nope, I can't re- trust you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, I'm always happy when they send like really good detailed notes right away because yeah. you can just follow those. And most of the time, and this is crazy to say, but I would never be able, I, I hate mixing with a lot of people in a room. I hate mixing with anyone that's listening from a different angle saying, can you turn up the kick? And you're just like, no, because it's out of phase where you're sitting. That's why you're not hearing it or something right. like that. It's really good when they're listening and then they take a day and they say, bring down the kick drum. So you do it and then they listen in their environment and usually they'll come back being like, okay, never mind. And you just go back to your reset. Well, and you know, the reminder, Rockstars, it's it's so much easier to do a revision of a mix when you have mixed notes because I never mix as quickly 
as that time when somebody hands me four changes to make and I go and make the four changes. I'm like, well, like that's it. I'm done. I got it. <laughs> you know, and print exactly. it. If I'm exactly. mixing for myself and try to make my own decisions, it takes much longer. And it never, it's never over. And it's never over. Well, uh, Mark, thanks again, man. What a pleasure hanging with you. Um, I look forward to uh, running into you in person again whenever we get to do that. And uh, hopefully, you know, by the time we're here in this, which um, will be months after we record it, um, every, the world will have changed for the better. In multiple ways, if yeah. you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Dude, so, and then in the meantime, of course, we are all incredibly grateful to you for making sure that we have lots and lots of movies and TV content to keep us yeah. company during quarantine. Thanks for that. Yeah. Well, that helped because the album world really dropped off, slowed yeah. down quite a bit. So it's interesting. Well, we'll see man. where it goes. For All the right, better. Dude. We'll All talk right, you soon, take dude. care. Thank you. All right, man. Talk to you. Cheers. Bye. Luke. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com and if you want more free content from recording studio rockstars all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email again that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email and i'll keep you in the loop with articles videos podcast updates and even free gear giveaways for your studio just look for the link in the show notes below thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rockstars now go make Make great music. Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our amazing sponsors who helped make this episode possible. OWC, Presonus, API Audio, Isotope, Sound Porter Mastering, Jay-Z Microphones, and Spectra 1964. You will find links to all these wonderful sponsors in our show notes. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio, and they're going to help you make your best record ever. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you in the next episode.